Hey everyone, I'm James Fitzgerald, uh, founder of OPEX, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about aerobic training as well as powerlifting and the combination of those two. Um, I have a larger background in fitness coaching um, as a young athlete, or spent a lot of time as a young athlete, and then after this fell in love with the iron because uh, it certainly taught me how to um, really helped define myself because I came from a, a background of sport where I got injured and then I fell in love with resistance which made me really recognize the importance of doing it for a lifetime. Um, and I've been doing this for over 25 years now. I uh, did the uh, practicing with bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, and then which led me to getting into fitness and the sport of fitness and uh, really just trying to dig in as to you know how you improve everyone in all these facets of resistance and glycolytic work and aerobic work. Um, which is really exciting um, and quite challenging. But today I want to discuss maybe to a number of you that may not be, this is specifically to the group that may not be involving some kind of aerobic work um, inside of their uh, powerlifting program, or let's call it, I'm going to put it, in, put it in a bucket of just doing only resistance only, and uh, talk a little bit about some of the benefits, ideas you could think about for progression of it, so you can ensure that you are actually uh, getting better and seeing some of the benefits of that and then lastly maybe some aspects of implementing this and putting it into action. Um, the question always remains when individuals talk about what kind of cardiorespiratory activity or cardiovascular act activity they should partner up with let's call it resistance is the fear of losing aspects of that max potential of the resistance and so just to quash those specific rumors because of only brevity and the time we have to today, the main scientific evidence that was done, concurrent methods, was not with the wrong intent, but they really didn't investigate the modalities that are together in combining resistance and the cardiorespiratory modalities that are used. Secondly, people always get really concerned around uh, you know, uh, getting lean or losing muscle and losing appropriate uh, resistance capability because of the time they're spending doing cardiovascular complications. Um, or cardi cardiovascular activity and the reason why that argument is there is that most times people have prescribed cardiorespiratory stuff incorrectly. But hopefully I'll give you some um, aspects of um, how you can do that more appropriately. And then another area where people get a little bit scared uh, based upon it is that it may take away with overall readiness and intensity um, and your ability to do resistance frequently and to get towards a maximum peak for a year or a couple times a year or whatever you need to to do it for um, and in a lot of cases again that's incorrectly prescribed cardiorespiratory activity. Um, first of all some things to think about for the benefits of it. Um, the biggest one, the largest benefit is that in between any of those resistance uh, areas you are actually increasing blood flow um, and so there's some things to be said uh, that you're not really going to find in scientific literature but mainly in empirical data where people do this effectively that having blood flow through multiple different actions that may not even be actual exercise in between tougher resistance training sessions is going to lead to a uh, it's going to help speed up recovery between each of those sessions okay and there's a number of different things the, the litany of things actually that blood flow is going to certainly help with um, including removing any tip, different kinds of products, actually helping in a natural detoxification process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and blood flow is just going to be highly effective. So one of the main benefits for doing any of that aerobic activity in between those resistance training sessions is going to benefit is going to maybe speed up your opportunity to recover in a short amount of time between those intense pieces. Okay. Secondarily, if you want to think of it as having, you know, just put, you know, five different really tough contractions in a specific, uh, in a specific session up there um, on the board, is that what you're going to do for your training session? Any of these uh, cardiovascular activities, when done correctly, where you're trying to really just move blood and slowly try to improve aerobic mechanisms, is going to allow you to recover even faster between each of those intense pieces of resistance. So let's just say it may take, you know, 11 minutes for a certain intense piece that may be shortened even to 10 and a half minutes or 10 minutes. I'm just trying to give you an idea over time as to shortening uh, that window. And the way that that window gets shortened is based upon your aerobic uh, competency and the ability of that aerobic system to allow you to shorten those windows. And hopefully it'll make sense to you then. If you can make those windows shorter, you might be able to do more intensive contractions per session. Okay? And of course there's a sweet spot which I'll get to, but that's, that's uh, some of the uh, big time benefits based upon that. 
Uh, secondary benefits that you're going to get from that is possibly being able to do some functional things um, in between your um, in between your sessions. So you may be actually be able to do functional activity at a much better rate because you're going to have an aerobic system to support it. Um, you possibly it may possibly incre increase. Uh, mobility. Um, some different changes in blood flow can result in changes in mobility for some individuals. Um, it actually may allow you to uh, burn certain fuel substrates for your volume of training or supplementary resistance that you're doing at a more effective level. So these are indirect things that are going to happen, but it's something you may want to look at as being a benefit. So there are some significant benefits, all things being aside of your fears I wanted to clear up around cardiorespiratory activity or aerobic training. Um, there's just you know really two big positive benefits there um, in terms of blood flow and recovery between sessions. So for progression of it, I guess, well, yeah, we'll talk about progression first. I'm gonna make the assumption that when people are starting to do this, you're only doing resistance. So the idea that you need to have in mind is that um, you're doing aerobic training here for that main benefit of recovering between intense sessions of resistance, okay? You're not doing aerobic sustainable work to help you become an aerobic sustainable champion. And that's, the, that's a performance aerobic area that's slapped on top of what you're trying to do, which is performance and resistance, and to make that as best as possible. You're gonna have massive benefits to the central nervous system, and of, of course, the proposed ideas I told you about recovery, um, if you progress this from, with the idea in mind that you're just trying to become as sustainable as you can. So if you have that kind of context in mind or that idea in mind, it should, have, it should give you no problems in terms of progressing this thing effectively. So I'll make it really simple. If you're starting with zero, you want to start with just doing something. Um, and I know that sounds you know, too general or maybe reductionist, but you don't want to start a four times a week, 60 minute aerobic program if you've never done anything. So the progression from you going from zero up to the point where you can do sustainable, consistent aerobic activity that helps support your resistance, they'll work better together if you start from where your current capabilities are. So if you're at zero, I'm gonna ask you to start with just doing something that's a very small amount and then slow drip and increase in that volume and measure it per week. So if you're doing nothing, I want you to start with doing five to 10 minutes of something, a very, very easy, I'll talk about implementation, what that looks like, but in terms of time, I want you doing that five to 10 minutes per day and then adding volume to that over a period of time. And then I'll discuss how you're gonna to get to a, a point of diminishing returns on that, but that's where you wanna start. The progression of this over time, again, the total volume of aerobic work has to fit around, obviously, your resistance progression, but you also wanna think about function. That means that how much can you actually fit into your lifestyle, um, and that'll kinda of be the, the point in which you're gonna to have to ensure you're doing enough that's gonna help support your resistance, and your resistance improvements are gonna give you feedback to determine if you're doing too much or too little over time. But I want you to progress first by getting up to a point where you can do, and I'll just give a number to make sense of something you can search for, 30 minutes consistently per day, seven days a week, okay? And I'm, I'm saying this only, not as a rule, but I'm saying this only for people that are starting with zero. So your goal is to improve that ability for you to do 30 minutes of sustainable activity. I'll tell you what that's gonna be in a bit. Sustainable activity, seven days a week for 30 minutes. So if you're at zero, do five minutes a day, seven days a week. Go to seven minutes next week. Go to 10 minutes the week after, go to 12. It's as easy as that. We know this to be true in terms of progression for resistance. It's no different for the aerobic system. So start doing really slow, sustainable activity the whole time. How fast should that pace be? When you're doing all of these intervals, even up to 30 minutes, or sorry, all these pieces of work up to 30 minutes, they should all feel like you can do it for a really long period of time. Because again, our goal is to make yourself as aerobic as possible and sustainable as possible, and to get the benefits of blood flow, and not necessarily to try to fit a whole bunch of really intense cardiovascular activity in that short period of time. So get, a whole, get all that bullshit, fat burning zones and et cetera out of, your, out of your head. You have to approach this as if you need to just try to make yourself as sustainable as possible for as long as possible and so start there. So that's gonna turn into 10 minutes, seven times a week, 12 minutes, seven times a week, 14, you're getting what I'm saying, up to 30. And the whole time you're doing this activity, it has to be sustainable. So once you get up to 30 minutes, seven times a week, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the modalities and what that's gonna look like, and I'll come back to as well pace, the entire time you're doing this 30 minutes, it's easy work and it's sustainable and it should be at a rate that could last you for hours just to give you an idea in terms of what the pace should be like. So if you get 10 minutes into your piece on the 12th week and you're supposed to be lasting 25 minutes and you're going way too hot in which you can't sustain that pace and it can't be sustainable for hours, then you're probably working at the incorrect rate. 
And this allows you not then to use biomarking devices like heart rate or anything else. You get to use an intuitive self-pace to determine if you're going in the right direction, even as you want to vary up those modalities. So make sure that you have this idea of first getting up to a certain amount of volume you can fit into your function or your lifestyle. I gave you an example of seven days a week of 30 minutes each time of sustainable work that would last for a couple of hours, but you're only doing it for 30 minutes. The progression of that over time is that you're going to make that 30 minutes a little faster, a little faster over time. Now, I'm going to stop uh, at that in terms of long-term progression because it can get a little bit more specific, but you want to know that the diminishing returns on that are when you can't sustain whatever that new pace you've chosen for the 30 minutes over a period of time is when you can't stay steady state for the entire 30 minutes. That's when you know you're not going to get, you're going to get diminishing returns on the cardiovascular activities, okay? So if you start out, you know, at two minutes, <laughs> seven days a week each day, and then it gets up to 30 minutes, and every time you do the 30 minutes now, you're like up, hanging, mm, easy, done, no, you know, slopping, flopping on the floor, you don't have a massive sweat bucket all around you, you're basically doing it so that you could sustain it for a couple hours, let's say, you're still getting massive benefits of what we talked about previously that's going to help your resistance just by you doing that, okay? And the progression is, let me just take that 30 minutes, seven days a week, and you, this is just for one person example, you extract that out over two years, if I look at that person and I measured what they were doing on that Tuesday for 30 minutes, that rate at which they were doing the 30 minutes should be faster than what they were doing for the 30 minutes two years ago. So see what I did there? I built all the volume up first. I kept the pace the same the whole time. It's all about sustainability. And my progression is my rate and my speed is going to increase, okay? Because that's still going to create a little bit of an adaptation and a little bit of a change to the cardiovascular system because it's a skill-based system that takes a little time to kind of get in place. And remember, we're doing this to lift more weights and to get a higher peaks. We're not doing it to become an aerobic champion or win a marathon. As far as implementation, I just talked about the progression of total load, but the things that you want to be thinking about for, um, you want to track really two things or think about two things. The modalities you choose need to be non-eccentric activities. So that means no running, no bounding, no jump rope, um, no burpees, no CrossFit workouts, you know, that you're calling cardiovascular activity. Nothing that's going to be stretch shortening cycle or anything that's going to result in dynamic contractions. So no, you can't do fancy gymnastics movements within that period of time and call it cardio. They have to be strictly modalities that are non-eccentric. Things that we're gonna, you're going to see me actually participating in or practicing would be something like a ski erg. Walking may or may not fit in there. Over time, you'll see that the rate of walking is going to have to turn into a run. That's why it's, there's a diminishing return on the eccentric activity of uh, running turning into walking. Uh, rowing, flywheel bike, um, yeah, ski erg, flywheel bike. Uh, rowing oh, and swimming. So I know you have a whole ton of lean mass and you're generally uh, bigger than the normal person, um, but if you, if you can find some efficiencies in the water, um, even if it's a stroke that doesn't gas you out and you can do consistently over a period of time, it's a fantastic idea for cardiovascular activity that could be really aerobic and lead to real, a lot of those benefits in blood flow. So when you implement that, I'm going to ask you to change up the modalities every day um, and for you to gain skills on all of those modalities over a period of time so that every day you're doing a different modality up to the prescribed functional total time that I told you with the idea of keeping those cardiovas cardiovascular uh, movements um, the, uh, the same thing per week. So you can make it Monday flywheel bike, Tuesday ski erg, Wednesday rowing, Thursday swimming and then keep going with the other three modalities or differences for the other three days of the week and just keep varying that over and over and over and the more variation you have in there I should mention you should also do an upright bike as a possibility the more variation you have in there it's going to lead actually to you not getting any overuse injuries any adaptations to the faster metabolic demands you're not going to be coming, becoming as elite aerobically on the flywheel bikes you're not doing it seven days a week which is a good thing and it's going to offer you some variations that's going to allow you to appreciate the differences in aerobic training that's going to be beneficial to your resistance. So that's the first thing you're going to track. Different modalities, non-eccentric all the time. Secondly, you have to track very closely, which I know you're doing in your paper and your, your feedback forms and the, your data that you're keeping, you have to watch all your resistance metrics. So you want to make sure that you're still progressing at a rate that you were supposed to be progressing at just to ensure that you're not moving past that sweet spot. Because you'll certainly find this, this is what happens when you do concurrent methods like this. You'll do a period of two or three weeks of cardiorespiratory activity, 
and you'll actually feel like you're getting stronger, but really what you're getting there is compensatory actions of cortisol and stress from the cardiorespiratory activity. So this is with people who do way too hard cardio for a couple of weeks. They actually will get a little peak of getting stronger. So if they're taking their in a notebook, they're like, oh shit, I'm getting stronger. This cardiorespiratory activity is helping. And then two weeks later, they're weak as shit. And they can't recognize what happened there is because they did the incorrect progression of aerobic training. So you need to track really closely and follow this progressive order with easy aerobic work and those benefits based upon the progression I talked about and track your resistance really tight because you want to see if there's any shifts in your central nervous system recovery. Um, if you effed up on a, a cardiorespiratory activity or aerobic training session, you'll notice it right away, um, maybe a week down the line that you should have you know, changed the pace that you had in those aerobic, uh, cap uh, aerobic things that you did. So to recap, Many benefits, main ones including blood flow as well as keeping the central nervous system um, just you know flushing the whole system out to make sure that you're recovering between those intense pieces and it's going to help you recover between all your intense contractions. Progression, make sure if you're starting at zero you build it up to a certain functional volume. Long term progression of that is just pace but it still be a, has to be at a rate that could last you hours no matter what you put into your uh, ability. Not heart rate, not specific you know uh, differences in those zones of heart rate you should be at a pace that should last you for hours. So it's gonna feel like you're finished, like what did I get from that? You got lots of benefits from that, okay? And then lastly, non-eccentric activity that you improve, that you in place inside of that training session. And you gotta track your resistance as well as I would say, I didn't add to this, but resistance and body weight just to make sure that you're managing that system out over a period of time.